Some of you have been hearing and trying to figure out the crazy chords from jazz and gospel musicians and you can't do it and it's most likely because you have not focused on memorizing the 10 chords in this video. So if you're trying to figure out the chords from gospel songs or jazz songs or you struggle to transcribe, get your pen and paper and without further ado, let's count down starting at number 10. Y'all heard that? That's the 1305. Your ear has to hear that. It's a type of dominant chord. We say no five because here's an F dominant chord and it doesn't have the fifth note, which is the C and it contains the 13, which is the D. But what I listen for to hear this specific chord is a minor chord and a tritone, a minor chord and a tritone. Put them together. Check out this version of Corey Henry doing this version of Faith on my channel. Wow. There it is. There's the chord he played. Sean, how'd you pick up that chord? Some of you have seen that video. You see me cover that on YouTube and you wonder, how did he pick up that video so fast? I listened for the minor chord. I listened for the tritone. Put them together. That's the 1305. It's the sound of the 1305. Let's see another one. Killing me softly with this song. So when I covered that, a lot of people wondered how I So those chords that I did there, right? Gospel, man, these 1305 chords, every time gospel musicians play them, a lot of people like it and they wonder what it is. But if you can tune your ear to hear the 1305 sound, I had a minor chord and a tritone taking those up half steps. So again, the 1305 chord. Listen for it. All right, so you need to be able to hear sharp 11 bass chords. Um, personally, you, you may be wondering why I'm saying sharp 11 bass chords, and it's because there's a bunch of chords that all fit in this category. The sharp 11 is really the fourth note. So let's say that we are starting from a C, one, two, three, four would be an F, but take that up an octave and also take it up a half step. So it's always going to include the fourth note raised a half step. But really, this is just your ability to hear um, what I call a Lydian bass sound. And I love this sound. Check out my video on Lydian voicings. Really great video. Uh, the basis of this chord, though, is that you can take two major chords and separate them by a whole step. So let's say that we take a C major and I'm going to play a C major in my right hand. And I'm going to take this chord up a whole step. And that sound, and from that idea comes multiple chords. One of them is called the inverted dominant. I have a video on that. And that's going to be just a D major over a C. The other one is just played the way we just have it here. And this is a six, nine sharp 11. The other type of chord is if you take this and instead of playing the five here, we can play the flat seven, which is a C 13 chord, sharp 11. So all of these are three different types of chords. And I want you to hear all of them. I'm going to use all of these in context. So check this out. Let's do the first one. If it wasn't part, this part's a little bit different. You know, it's hard to hear. But listen. If you didn't hear that, it, it said, if it wasn't for your love, wasn't for your grace, I don't know where I'd be without you. So did you hear that? Now this chord here, it's D913, it's a sharp 11. I call it a Lydian bass, bass voicing, even though it contains the 13. And the reason why is because at the basis of this chord, you have a D major, and if I were to have a D major in both hands and I separate one by a whole step up and I move this up a whole step, 
And I said, if you change the fifth note to a seven, that that's the basis of the chord. I don't know where I'd be. See? So that is an idea. That is a, that's an example of the 13 sharp 11. So let's look at another example. Oh, tell me who can stand for us when we call on. There it is, that chord there. See? right there now it's the same chord even though i have the a i left the a off because i'm not looking at this functionally i'm looking at this in what I'm, my ear is hearing and what my ear is hearing is an f dominant chord in, in the left hand but a whole step up and a g major in the right hand and that's an indication to me that i'm playing a sharp 11 based chord i also said it includes inverted dominance um so total praise Lord, I will lift my eyes to the hills. See the sound here? That's another sign that I'm playing this a, a sharp 11 bass chord. It's not a diminished chord. It's a dominant chord. So let's call it inverted dominant. And I changed it, but still kept the characteristic of the chord because I have an A flat at the bottom and a whole step up. I have a B flat major chord. See, there it is again, there it is again, there it is again. So the ear picks up, my ear is picking up when that sharp 11 sound is there. And I did it a bunch of times there. So did you catch it? Were you able to hear the sharp 11 based chord? Okay, so hearing the dominant nine chord, a uh, staple in gospel music, and to hear this one, it relies on your ability to hear, watch I'll explain this, the half diminished chord over the root. So if we take a D half diminished chord, it's D, F, A flat, and C, and the root is going to be a major third away from the bottom note. So it sounds like this. Uh, so let's hear that in context. Okay, that chord, that's your nine. Now, notice how it was played. It's the sound that I'm listening for. So this sound here is still a half diminished chord. And in fact, that half diminished chord was inverted. So we can play it like this. We could play it up here. We could play it up here, but you gotta remember the bass note. That's the sound of the dominant nine. So this is for the sound of the dominant nine. The dominant nine. All right, the nine says four. So for me, this one was the easiest for me to pick up. It's formed by taking the first note, the fourth note, the flat seven, and the nine. And that's the essential characteristic of this chord. More often than not, when you hear this chord, you get the sense that it's not done, like there's something else that needs to happen. For example, let's listen to the song. It would take six, Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say does that star spangled As you can see, that part, see how that sounds like something needs to come after it? So it doesn't sound fully resolved. That's an example of the nine sus four chord. And if I stop there, you're like, Sean, what's going on? <laughs> Play the next chord. You want to sound, we want to hear what's coming next. And again, the one, the four, the flat seven, and the nine. But there are other chords that go along in this family as well. You have the regular sus four, which sounds like this. You hear that sound? You have the seven sus four, which sounds like this. You have the nine sus four, which we just went over. And you even have the 13. 
So what if I were to, so if I play Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? So Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. See, that's an example of the sus four. The same family. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. That's the seven sus four. And then here's your nine sus four. Fleece was white as snow. See, that's that, that's that sound. So 13 sounds like this. Fleece was white as snow. It almost doesn't sound resolved, right? It sounds like... Sus. So again, it sounds like something needs to happen after that. So that's how your ears can pick up on that nine sus four chord or any sus chord because it will sound incomplete, like something needs to happen after that. All right, the dominant seven flat nine. When you hear this chord, you'll like it because the gospel musicians use this a lot. And, and it's really, it's going to always sound like a diminished chord, but it's really a dominant seven flat nine chord. Um, and it's so basically... If I were to take, let's say I were to take a G7 like this, and I just add the 9, which is an A, and I make it flat, this is called a G7 flat 9. And if I remove the bass, you have this diminished chord here. So anytime I play one of these diminished chords over a G, then it will be a flat nine, but I can also play these same chords over other bass notes. So what has to happen is your ear has to kind of hear, okay, it's a diminished chord, but the bass is doing something else. And that's an indication to me that it's a, a dominant seven flat nine chord. Let's look at an example. Uh, this is Waymaker. All these videos are on my channel, folks. So, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, what is the word? Promise Keeper, <laughs> Lighter Than Nine, my God, I'm not a singer. That is, okay, so that is who you are. So, there, there's an E flat on the bass, but then Sean did. So, this diminished chord being played over this bass gives me a dominant seven flat nine you have to be able to hear that if i were to play amazing grace and see how sweet the sound that's it this is a, i'm playing it like a diminished chord but i know i know this is a dominant seven flat nine because there's an e at the bass see amazing grace how sweet the sound See how that sounds? That's the, that's the sound of the dominant seven flat nine. The key is, the key is to focus on the diminished seven quality. Okay, so now we're dealing with the sharp nine, sharp five, and all the types of dominant chords you can hear. Dominant chords can be a little bit challenging to pick up in terms of the type of dominant chord it is. I like to start from the sharp nine, sharp five, and then go from there. So let's say we have a dominant chord with an F, the three, which is an A, and the flat seven, which is E flat. So the way I find this uh, chord is to take the bottom note, which is an F, go up five, and then play a major chord on the half step up from that, which is a D flat chord. So you can hear how that sounds, but really the way that we're used to hearing it is a lot, it has that crunch. So it sounds more like, see that, see that sound? That sound there, that's a sharp nine, sharp five. And one of the things you're gonna have to train your ear to do, um, because see the, the way I'm playing this chord here, see how close, see? So if your ear focuses on the fact that this is a minor second, you'll get confused instead of just hearing the total chord. So we basically operate off of the nine and the five. 
So what I mean by that is, let's take this in C. So here's a C7, which is a C dominant chord. The ninth note would be a D. And the fifth note would be the G. But I'm going to play it an octave up. So there's a lot of combinations we can have here. The ninth note could be dropped a half step, and the fifth note could be dropped a half step, right? Then the fifth note could be raised a half step. So you have all these various combinations. So instead of listening for tension notes, like is this sharp or is this flat? I, I don't do it that way. So let me tell you how I look at this. There are four combinations of the nine and five that I think it's important, at least for me to hear. And this is the way that I do it to find dominant chords with tensions quickly. So it, it comes down to memorizing major and minor triads over a dominant chord. So let's take C dominant, which is C, E, and B flat. If I were to go up five from the root and go up a half step, and I play a major chord on that half step, that's a sharp nine, sharp five, no matter how I play it. No matter how I play that. So it's sharp nine, sharp five. If I go up five and play and go down a half step, and I play that F sharp triad or G flat triad over the same notes in the bottom, that's a flat nine, flat five. No matter how I, even if I spread that out, flat nine, flat five. So it comes down to listening for a triad, not listening for the whole chord, listening for a triad in one hand, dominant chord in the other hand. But I can go further. I can also go to the nine. I can go down a half step and play a minor chord on that half step. And since I went down, that's indication that it's a flat nine, sharp five. The other option is I can go to the nine. I can go up a half step, minor chord there, dominant chord left, together. And since I went up on the nine, it's a sharp nine, flat five. So you have four triads, two major, two minor, that can happen over this one dominant chord. One, two, three, four. So even though I said focus on the sharp nine, sharp five, that's a starting point. You got to get all of them. But this is kind of how I am hearing dominant chords with tensions. Okay. Hmm. Spread diminished triads. So these are when the musician plays these big chords in their left hand. They're spread like this. It sounds like diminished chords, right? You need to be able to hear this. They're usually spread out. So you'll usually hear it in the left hand. See, those are the, how those sound. So those are called spread diminished triad, but there's a lot of variations of this chord. So I want you to see this. I'm going to go back to the F. D and A flat. This could be a diminished chord if I were to play it like this, right? See? So this is a diminished chord. But I'm going to play the same notes in the bottom and I'm going to change the left hand. This would be a minor chord now. You heard that? So the same Group of chords in the left hand is now minor. So this is a minor six, minor six sound, minor six sound. The same chord in the left hand, if I play a B flat, changes to a dominant. It's, it's, I call it an inverted dominant. Check my video on that. See that sound? Inverted dominant chord. And this is my fancy way of saying a dominant chord that has any note other than the root on the bottom. So the F is on the bottom. It may sound a little bit like a, a just a, a regular old B flat major. Here's a B flat major. 
but here's the inverted dominant. See, da, 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 da. you gotta pick out that note there. It's an inverted dominant. Or I could play it as a, a minor six nine. So I'm gonna go down to another one. Ooh, love that chord. That's that minor six nine sound. So you can also play this as a diminished major seven <laughs> by adding a, a D flat triad on top. So crazy sound here. Listen, that's just crazy. This is a diminished, listen to this. This is the sound of the diminished major seven. All right. So again, in the left hand, it will always be a spread diminished triad, but the quality of the chord will change based on what you're listening for in the right hand. Many of you are aware that I did not start transcribing until the first video on this channel. My first video was my first attempt at transcribing and the system that I used to transcribe at that time and still rely on is my four tier system. And these chords are major seven, minor seven, half diminished and dominant. And it's about memorizing the quality of these chords. This is not perfect pitch because perfect pitch doesn't hear chord qualities. It hears one note at a time. Developing your ear to hear these four chords means you could become a master at relative pitch, which is far more useful to you as a musician than perfect pitch. And I'm going to say that again. Mastering relative pitch and your ability to hear chord qualities is far more useful to you than having perfect pitch. One of the things I do in my live sessions on Monday is I test their ability to hear and recognize these four chord types. Uh, so let's do a quick demonstration of that now. So what sound is this? That'd be a minor seven. It doesn't matter what the root note is. You just need to be able to tell the chord quality. Let's try another one. This is a half diminished chord. Let's try another one. That's a dominant chord. Let's try another one. That's a major seven. It doesn't matter if the notes are stacked. For instance, if I have a major seven here and I start adding additional notes, it doesn't matter. I'm adding the same notes. The quality doesn't change. It's still a major seven. So it doesn't matter how the notes are arranged. So that's why I'm saying you're listening for a sound. You're not, you're not trying to do like perfect pitch, which would be listening for individual notes. You're listening for a quality. You're listening for a sound. All right. So let's try this one. For instance, right? I have a lot of notes pressed here. This is a half diminished chord, a minor seven flat five or a half diminished chord in its base form. It would just be this but I've, I've added some bottom notes and I've added how it would really occur in a song, but notice it's all the same notes and I'm listening for that quality. Let me try another one. This should be a dominant chord. Try another one. This would be a major seven. Another one. This is a minor seven. So you want to be able to focus on hearing these types of chords quickly and again, train your ear and just change your mindset. It's not the amount of notes that you're hearing. It's the, just the overall quality. And by the way, I don't, when I was using this four tier system um, to transcribe when I first started my channel, I, I grouped, because some of you may be saying that there are other chords that aren't listed here. Well, I, the diminished for me was a part of the dominant sound and the sus voicing was a part of the major sound. And so I can still get maybe 95% of my, all of my chords just by grouping everything under one of these four sounds. It's a really cool way to pick things up quickly, commit them to memory, learn their qualities as quickly as you can, and you'll be picking up songs in no time. Okay, so you may be wondering, first of all, why am I including this so high on the list in the number two spot? And also, Sean, didn't you already cover major and minor chords in the last section? Well, although we did cover them in the last section, I have a term I made up here called the integrated 
major and minor seventh. And they also include just regular bass major and minor chords. But for me, what this is, it's your ability to hear when a major or minor seven or a major minor chord is embedded within another chord. Let me give you an example. We discussed the 13 sus chord, for instance, um, earlier. So in reality, the way that I looked at this was not hearing the whole chord itself. Actually, if I take off that bass note, it's just simply a major seven. Right? And the B f flat is at the bottom. So I know it's a 13 sus because it's a combination, but, but what my ear is hearing in the way that I'm doing this is my ear is actually hearing a major seven chord with another bass note. And I know the sound of the major seven. I know the sound of the 13 sus and putting those together helps me approximate very quickly. How about the E, uh, let's do the E minor nine. That sound there. Well, yeah, if you're able to recognize this as a chord, you recognize this as a minor nine chord, but you may not. It's actually easier for me to recognize this as a major seven with the E in the bass. See, I'm not talking about function, whether this, we, we know that functionally a G major seven is way different than an E minor nine, but the ear doesn't care about function. These are very much the same. These are very much the same when we're talking about the ear. And I actually suspect that some of you, when you hear a chord and you're calling it major when it should be minor you could be correct because what's happening is your ear could be picking up on the major quality within the chord and you're just not you're disregarding your ears disregarding the bass note right so there's an approach to ear theory that i have which says that most chords are combinations of types of chords and by just memorizing and focusing on the major or minor quality, you can actually find the chord very quickly. Do you remember when I was discussing the 1305? Well, you can see this as a 1305, which is a type of dominant chord, but I could just simply see this as a C minor over the D flat. Look at Christmas time is here. Um, I'm going to go to another chord that we did before. So Christmas time is here. Look at this chord here. We discussed this chord, uh, the sharp 11. And I even described this earlier in a video that the sharp 11, you may have heard me describe in a many of these chords, I had them as major chords over something else because it's easy to hear that way. If I'm hearing this as a, here's a, here's a nice Christmas time is here. F major, F major, over this E flat dominant, over this E flat dominant. See, so it's an embedded, the, the, the major chord is embedded within this chord. And so what you're trying to do is train your ear to recognize major and minors quickly, rather than trying to memorize thousands of types of chords you're just memorizing the major and minor and when you can hear it and the better you get is we're just focusing in we have that laser focus to help us to pick up these things and then you can hear them quickly even within other contexts and within other chords my proof that this system works let's go to number one The tritone, the most important sound to hear, the number one spot is the almighty tritone. It is not a chord, it is an interval. An interval is the distance between two notes. Now, like many ear teachers, my courses teach you to recognize all the intervals. However, the tritone is the most important interval to recognize, particularly the integrated tritone. After that, it would be your ability to recognize the perfect fifth, which is also a perfect fourth for some folks since the ear doesn't care much about the direction. And the tritone along with the perfect fifth um, form the basis of all the chords that we've discussed here. Remember the four chords I told you about number three, the major, the minor, the, the half diminished and the dominant. 
Well, the major is really just two perfect fifths stacked on each other. The minor, the minor seven is just two perfect fifths stacked on each other. The dominant chord, the primary notes in the dominant chord are the third and the seventh, and that's a tritone. Third and seven. That's a tritone. The presence of that tritone tells me that it's a dominant chord, half diminished. The first note and the third note. Tritone. So the presence of the tritone versus the presence of a perfect fifth helped me to quickly, in number three, determine whether chord is dominant, major seven, minor seven, or half diminished. So you may already be able to recognize tritones when they're played like this. By the way, cool thing about tritones is that for the tritone, it doesn't matter where the notes are. If I put this E in the bottom, it's still a tritone. So it doesn't matter. The direction doesn't matter as much as the perfect fourth, which changes to a perfect fifth when I change the position of this F. See, it changes to a perfect fifth here. If I put the F on top, it's a perfect fourth. The tritone is a tritone, regardless of the direction. So if I take this F sharp to the bottom, it's still a tritone. So that's the cool thing about the tritone. And if you're able to recognize the presence of the tritone within a chord, it can be very helpful. Let's take this example, for instance. So here is this chord here where I'm hearing in the bass in the left hand, I'm hearing this tritone. See if you can hear it. So my ear is trying to got to pick up that tritone within the chord. Now I have a major chord up top here. I have a perfect fourth here. I have a perfect fourth here. I have a major chord and I have a tritone. And with all of that, I can get that chord. And I know this may take a different way of thinking because some of you it may be just easier to recognize this as an F sharp major seven flat five sharp five for me. That's not <laughs> because I wouldn't know that, but I would know that I hear a, a tritone. I would know that I hear a major. Uh, how about this? Remember we talked about the E, remember we talked about the E1305 going back to that first chord again. And I said that it was a minor chord over bass well now with this i can say now with the presence of the tritone i can say it's a minor chord over tritone it's a lot more specific and it can help me find that chord much quicker remember this chord i talked about here we talked about the flat nine flat five which was indicated in the sharp nine sharp five section I hear a major chord, and I hear a tritone. Here's a tritone. Here's a major chord. Here's it together. Okay. Uh, one, one hint I want to tell you is that the tritone generally will occur in the left hand. So it will be towards the bottom of the chord. So you want to train your ear to listen to these sounds here. They usually be in this section. They're not going to be played all over the keyboard. It's usually going to be in just around this section right here. Right? And, and so being able to hear that interval is very important. Train your ear, learn all your intervals, but pay close attention to the tritone and when you can hear it in a chord it will help you so much it'll help you to identify the chord it will help you to tell you what the root is if you know that every dominant chord contains a tritone it can help you to find half diminished chords so many reasons i say that this is the most important thing that your ear needs to hear the tritone wow so that concludes this guide on the 10 chords you need to be able to hear to accelerate your learning and to be able to pick up 
chords from jazz and gospel musicians by ear. Now for the next 10 weeks, I'll be doing a live in-depth training for those that are on my website. So definitely be on the lookout in your emails for more information on that. And if you're not a part of our website community, this would be a great time to check us out. We'll have links in the description for you. You also see something here on the screen. Now, if you happen to come across this video later and it's after the 10 weeks, and you're not able to join us live. You can still see this information on our website. It will be a course and it will actually have more information there we'll have quizzes and activities and ear training things for you so that you can pick up these things in depth so that you can be on your way to training your ear to hear these types of chords thanks again for watching talk to me in the comments i'll see you guys next week